Lock it up. Ohio State has a full staff again, and Carlos Lachlan is the last member of it. He's going to be out on the practice field Wednesday morning, getting the ground running. This is the podcast daily for Wednesday as the Buckeyes get back to work. That is Jeremy Birmingham. I am Austin Ward in Berm. So Monday night, uh, Ohio State came to terms officially with Lachlan, who has spent the last two years as the running backs coach at Oregon. What was the first thing that you thought about this uh finalization of the coaching staff in this pick to replace Tony Alford? Um, it's what I think I've been saying or trying to hint for like the last two weeks that like Ryan Day had a guy, but he just didn't, no one, he didn't want anyone to know who it was. Uh, if, if you think about it from a football perspective, obviously there is uh, um, a lot on the plate of Carlos Lachlan in a short amount of time. That's all. It's interesting, but it's also concerning to some, I imagine, because you're like, well, he hasn't established himself anywhere. Blah, blah, blah. The other side of that is he's worked really hard to get to the top of the mountain at the running backs coach position very quickly. And that should be an indicator of what you can expect from him. Um, on the recruiting side, the work he's done to establish relationships and become a guy that recruits around the country are very familiar with is exceptional. The results have been mediocre because he's been at places, uh, you know, primarily where. Uh, he was not going to ever have a real chance. He's been at Oregon only two years, did a good job there. But Oregon recruits kind of weird, and they have a very bizarre um, and I don't want to say untalented recruiting base around them in the Oregon-Washington area, but it's certainly not talent-rich. They have to go down a lot into California, which has seen USC rise in the last couple of years. So it's been an interesting back and forth recruiting-wise, but he was at the forefront for two of the players that Ohio State has been recruiting at running back with Oregon and Jordan Davison and Bo Jackson out of out of Cleveland. So it's interesting uh, from that perspective because Ryan Day had told people that he was going to let the current players have uh, a say in this and, and have an opportunity to help interview the, the eventual choice. I don't think he meant the recruits, but it doesn't seem uh, a coincidence to me that two of the players that I would say were in Ohio State's like top four targets on the running back board um we're each highly considering carlos lachlan in oregon i don't think that's an entire coincidence well we when we've talked about this and ryan day himself going back to december and january in his public comments about well how do you evaluate decisions not just on retaining your staff but also if you're going to hire somebody else to come in and join it like aside from just mentioning cultural fit schematic fit being able to relate to the players like it starts almost every time with recruiting and i think probably running back position more than any other for an assistant coach requires that we joke and it's not meant to slight uh what running backs do and the importance to the offense but like if you're a very talented athlete and you're fast and you don't fumble the football it might be the easiest one to teach and develop um so that means you need to surround yourself with really talented players. And I think that's, uh, again, that's not a knock. You just have to have a running backs coach who can recruit at a high level because you're also only looking at two or three targets every single year. Yeah. I mean, if you look back at Ohio State football since 2017, how many true freshmen have really made a major impact on the, 20, on the Ohio State football season in the last seven years? How many? Uh, a small handful. I don't like know. Like two? Really, J.K. and Travion Henderson? I was trying to think of an exact number. I don't know if we were already going to throw Jeremiah Smith into there or not. Um, yeah, not, what, Michael Jordan? Is that in the last seven no, years? 2016, so I, that's right. why I Just outside the window. All right, gotcha. Yeah, so 2017 and 2021 are really the only times you have a true freshman. I mean, Denzel Burke in 2021, I guess, would have to be considered in that conversation as well, but... Uh, corner is another position where it's sort of like if you can just go out there and do the thing, then it, you don't need a lot of coaching, especially if the defense says just play on an island and go do whatever. You know, as a reminder, the 2021 Ohio State defense was pretty bad. Um, but it, what you get out of the running back position is like, here's the ball. Are you good at seeing a hole and running through it? And if you are, you can play early. Um, so to your point, running back coach is one where it is much more about just recruiting than nearly any other assistant coaching spot on the staff. So that is really the way that I think Carlos Lachlan has risen up through the profession. As you said, some of the results are 
hard to evaluate how they might translate specifically to Ohio State, but you can tell that everywhere he's been, some of the feedback I've received from people who know him and, and other places he's worked, it's been, first of all, talking about the work ethic. And and my friend John Bryce uh, at Football Scoop wrote a, a great in-depth, in-depth feature about him being in federal law enforcement doing something that he's not allowed to talk about. And then doing that during uh, late night shifts and then going to volunteer at the University of Memphis to get his foot in the door as a volunteer in the weight room and then working in recruiting departments and and other things that tr- that was parlayed into a role as high school relations at Florida State before going to Western Kentucky and then Oregon. So building relationships with young people, that seems to be the most natural fit for what he's doing. We're going to find out a lot more of him as a coach and and how he fits in with what Chip Kelly and Ryan Day and Justin Fry Keenan Bailey are are working to build offensively. Um, But again, if what we're saying is correct, that some of what you have to do in terms of fundamentals with running backs is going to be pretty basic and not that elaborate, then his ability to connect with people then should help him with Travion Henderson, Quinshawn Judkins, Dallin Hayden, you know, down the road, not just for bringing in the next wave of recruits, but it does seem to be that the through thread that everyone is talking about with Carlos Lachlan is his ability to connect with people. Yeah, and I mean, not that it's a, a surprise, but if you're working in law enforcement in Memphis, you're a tough dude. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you are someone who has seen some things, and you are someone who has uh, unfortunately seen the worst of, of humanity probably more often than you'd like to acknowledge. And so I think that that sort of background makes someone who's now – being paid six hundred thousand dollars a year to talk about football probably appreciate that a whole lot and the opportunity that he has now that he's worked for is something that i think he probably will not take for granted and and as we keep evolving in college football and keep going through um, these changes that the sport is uh, partaking in i think it's easier to find people who are like, man, I don't want to do this anymore. This isn't what I signed up for, like that type of thing. Like You're still coaching football for a living. And I I think when you have someone who's been through what he's had to have gone through to get there, you're going to find a guy that's committed to the cause and saying, I I could be doing something a whole hell of a lot worse than what I'm doing right now. So I, I like that because I think it does allow him to connect to kids in a way that a lot of recruiting coaches don't because there are a lot of kids Uh, playing high school football around America that have to go through a lot of crappy situations in their life to get to the other side. And when you can come at it from that perspective, it's certainly something that will be able to resonate. Yeah. uh, Our understanding of that contract as well, two years, $650,000 for uh, Carlos Lachlan. So a pretty uh, decent raise from what he was making at Oregon. Uh, But I I don't think still savings for Ohio state over what they were paying Tony Offer. Uh, yeah, I think the salary pool is going to be about even when you factor in the buyout paid right. to Oregon. Um, I mean, yes and no, uh, because Tony Alford was initially going to be making less. Um, I guess the, the total pool I think is going to be about the same, yeah. uh, but I don't know that this was solely motivated financially for Lachlan. Uh, It is a raise. It is important. He is moving up in the profession, but he had just gone through this process with Tennessee uh, a month or two ago to potentially be the running backs coach there in a part of the country where he's certainly familiar with and and been around the game for a long time, Um, but went back and signed a new deal with a raise to, you know, about 400,000 with Oregon. That's a comfortable living as well. I think the opportunity and the upside is probably more appealing in this situation where we talked about And Ryan Day talked publicly about who wouldn't want to be here and work with Travion Henderson and Quinshot Judkins and Dallin Hayden and and have the block go on their chest. I do think that that is important. Uh, The other part that you mentioned, Berm, is how quickly Lachlan has risen through the profession. I think the opportunity here is incredibly appealing. When you look at, you almost have to separate being in the process and people, we may have known too much about it, uh, reported too much about it when you get through three, four, or five candidates, there are more than just five good football coaches at every assist, at every position in the country. Uh, it, it, I don't think it should wind up being viewed as a negative for Ohio State. I think this worked out pretty well 
all things considered with his recruiting background, taking somebody from Oregon, which is now a, a Big Ten opponent, having them restart that process. I think this wound up being a win in the end, but I, I'm trying to remove thoughts about being in the process for the last three weeks and thinking that it took too long or that uh, candidate A, B, C, and potentially D got raises or couldn't work out buyouts to come join Ohio State. Like That felt disappointing at the time, and yet it still wound up in a place that I think Ohio State can feel pretty good about it. Yeah, again, especially because uh, this probably could have been done a week ago or maybe even longer than that. If you if you go by what Jordan Davison said, so Jordan Davison, the number one ranked running back in the country, according to Rivals.com, who was talking to Adam Gorney of Rivals uh, about the, the coaching change and said, I've known for a while. I just haven't said much about it. I've just been trying to keep it low. So a while is obviously subjective, but it does at least open the door for the fact that both Lachlan knew what was going on, Ohio State knew what was going on, and the only reason this last week was uh, was even waited out was so that that buyout would drop and cut in half. So, like, uh, if if this would have happened last Monday, and I, th- I think people probably would have been like, "Oh, they made that move pretty quick," but that one extra week makes it feels maybe that it took too long, but it seems like it was done then. And I mean, we had we had talked about it a week ago. Like, it felt like Ryan Day knew who his guy was. And we didn't know why he was waiting, but then once the name gets circulated, uh, which started on Saturday with Zach Smith and Menace Sports, by the way, which kudos to them for having that access and info. Good job. Um, but what you get out of that is one Ryan Day clearly playing a game pretty smartly. And I don't think he's getting enough credit for how he's handled this offseason nationally. Uh, but when you think about how this could have gone, like Ohio State could have been paying twice that buyout, uh, but because Oregon didn't start their full spring practice until Tuesday. To you know, they this hiring ends up being at the exact same timeline as Tony Alford's departure from Ohio State. So Ohio State had two acclimation periods, and then Alford left, and Oregon had two acclimation periods. They went on spring break, and then this is the decision. So it's actually kind of poetic in how it played out, but uh, timing wise, like I said, I, I think it could have been done sooner. But Ohio State obviously. Uh, saw an opportunity to save a couple bucks. So it's not a financially motivated decision, but if you can save half a million dollars, you're going to do it. Well, and I think that objectively evaluating it as well, I, I've said for the last several weeks, and I, I'm, I won't change my tune on that, could they have landed any of those other candidates if this had happened for Ohio State, if Tony Alford had left or Ryan Day had chose to move on from him in January? Could they have landed one of those other candidates? I think they probably could have. And I think that Robert Gillespie in particular was very uncertain about what the future looked like for him in Alabama. Uh, DeMarco Murray may have been using uh, any suitor, Michigan or Ohio State, both uh, or anybody else to get a raise. Maybe there was nothing that was going to get him away from his alma mater. Stan Drayton one, I think, is certainly pretty interesting given Temple did not want to have this is that's different than replacing a running backs coach in March and April. That would be the head coach and being incredibly behind the eight ball and maybe losing your entire roster uh, potentially if you if you don't uh, acquiesce to it. Is that a bad thing at Temple? Yeah, I, I mean, I frankly, if Temple is going to have to pay this amount of money later on, like yeah, which, November, which I'm not, sh- I, I don't really fully understand that. I, I can see the justification in wanting to play hardball, but. If they're going to have to pay that same amount to move on at the end of next season, which it seems like they want to, I don't know what they really accomplished other than delaying some of the suffering. But anyway, that's that's neither here nor there. That conversation may well have been different for two or three different people that Ohio State communicated with if it had happened in January. Now, it didn't. There's nothing that can be done to change that. Uh, Lachlan still may have wound up being strongly heavily in the mix if this had happened during that time and maybe it would have wound up with him being the the next running backs coach at ohio state no matter what i don't know there's no way for me to prove that i have suggested though that the conversations with the other candidates may have been different if the timeline had been but to your point ryan day already had to adjust and take different curveballs namely bill o'brien and then doing it again uh, a month and a half later with tony alford was not ideal but the outcome with chip kelly and Carlos Lachlan seems pretty remarkable given those circumstances. 
Yeah, and it's another indicator, I think, of where maybe we can see this Ohio State offense going this year because if you watch Oregon football and you see the way that they handle the running game and, and Lachlan's style and what he wants out of his running backs, I watched a couple of YouTube videos of him conversating with the Oregon media on Tuesday, and every conversation is physicality, physicality, physicality. He wants his running backs to be absolutely bruising. He wants those guys to be seeking contact, and maybe that's not ideal for Travion Henderson. Sure seems like it could be ideal for Quinshawn Judkins. Sure seems like it could be ideal for Dallin Hayden, who's excellent at it. Um, and you combine that with the, the addition of Chip Kelly and the, just the – roster edition of Quinshawn Judkins like this Ohio State run game this year could have a much different smash mouth feel to it and I think that it's a, an opportunity for all these sides to really uh, come up with something different for Ohio State which I'm, I'm excited to see what do you think of this concept or the argument that or I've seen a few Oregon fans online um, suggesting that this is a, a lateral move from Oregon to Ohio State. Do you believe that's a, a lateral move? That seems delusional to me. Um, trying to do some quick math. Um, when was the last time Oregon won a national championship again? Hold on. I got to Google. Uh, when, um, when will it be the next time that they get a full share of the broadcast deal from um, Big Ten? You know that one. Um, okay. Wait, wait, they wait. Are, Oregon, Oregon has never won a national Oh, game. never. Oh, yeah. uh, I'm surprised you. it took so long to find that information. I well, think I'm Oregon has... For all of the national championship season, so I just went through the list of national oh. championship winners. I didn't. I could have just Googled probably, has, has Oregon ever won a national championship? And I would have received a resounding no, but instead I was like just searching through each one yeah. because I, I assumed it would have had to have been sometime in the last 40 years, and I thought I could quickly scan through and, and decipher one. Yeah, I, I guess I guess that's the bit. Um, look, I am not suggesting that Oregon is not among. Yeah, they're a top ten program. Man. Annual like, contenders, good. Yeah. they are. I think that they're going to have a pretty difficult time in this transition from the from the Pac twelve slash Pac two slash whatever to the Big Ten for a number of reasons, and and maybe Dan Lanning will will prove this wrong. Uh, I don't know. That's the challenge ahead of him. But uh, you mentioned it early on. The fertile recruiting area doesn't really exist in Oregon or Washington, and that is how you have to build these rosters to compete for national championships and win them. I think Oregon has done a great job with the help of Phil Knight and with the help of good coaching, uh, Chip Kelly included in that process, to get them to a level that you have to take them seriously on the national landscape. But to suggest that they are on purely even footing with Ohio State, to me, I think that's nonsense. Yeah, and Oregon's done a great job taking advantage of uh, what opportunities NIL affords them with, with their connections with Nike, but they're still not unlimited money. And if you go, you know, their top 10 players might be as good as Ohio State's top 10 players, uh, but it's the 75 below that that are going to be the, the challenge. And um, Oregon is a top 10 program without question. I think that they will be the primary competitor for Ohio State to win the Big Ten this year, and I think that's going to set up an awesome game in October uh, at Autzen Stadium. Uh, but Carlos Lockun will just be on the other side of that this year. And uh, again, it's not a knock to Oregon to, to say it's not a lateral move. It's clearly a, 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 an upgrade. There are There's Ohio State, and there's Alabama, and there's Georgia, and there's everyone else. And that's just the way college football still is, even with Michigan winning the national championship. Even with Michigan beating Ohio State the last three years, it's still that way. At least from a national perspective, um, it, certainly Ohio State needs to stop that this year uh, to afford themselves the luxury to keep having that themselves included in that conversation. But nationally, there's still no real comparison between the top three and everyone else. And let's, I mean, even set aside the competitive landscape. The man got a raise, didn't he? Is that a lateral move or a promotion? Well, that's a, that's the question for people to figure out. I guess they could find it on Google uh, and, and decide for themselves. Because I, I don't know. I mean, more money is not always indicative of a, of a promotion. It's just a, it's, it is a lateral move from running backs coach to running backs coach. But I don't think anyone objectively is going to look at the opportunity at Ohio State versus the opportunity at Oregon and consider them the same. 
especially for a guy that's from this, you know, he's originally from Montgomery, Alabama, I think, right? So, but cut his teeth in Tennessee, like it's closer to where all of his family is. I mean, there are other things that go into a situation like this. Um, and we know Oregon fought to try to keep him. And, and I, you know, I think Ohio State fans certainly will understand better than anyone else right now how annoying the timing of this is for them. Um, mm-hmm. But maybe there, maybe there's no need to like dig the knife considering Ohio State just went through this three weeks ago. But it's it's not a lateral move. Well, and I don't I don't think he's doing anything out of spite. He seemed quite appreciative of his time at Oregon the last couple of years, based on the stories that I was told about him as he was leaving, and had those you know more than fifty handwritten notes that he passed around in the facility to all the people who helped put him in position to succeed as the Oregon's running back or as Oregon's running backs coach, which also propelled him in my opinion, to the next level as an assistant from Oregon going to Ohio State. And if the Ducks uh, feel slighted by that, I can understand why they would, but maybe they'll just settle it in October. But uh, it seems like a a fair result here for Ohio State, Uh, an appreciative uh, Carlos Lachlan showing uh, his thanks to the Ducks as he left. And he's going to be, I'm told, back out there already on the practice field or out there for the first time in the Woody Hayes Athletic Center on Wednesday We'll be there, too, as we'll hear from a handful of Buckeyes, a couple more assistants and some more players as a uh, what we got a week and a half left until the spring game in the horseshoe. We'll have full coverage of uh, practice and everything else the rest of this week on the podcast daily. This was TPD for Wednesday. He's Berm. I'm Austin. Thanks for joining us. See ya.